information that I think it's important for everybody to have about something called advanced directives. Advanced directives are merely a formal piece of paper that tells health officials, health workers, what preferences you have in an emergency situation if you can't communicate. It's the piece of paper that says, here's what I want done, or here's what I don't want done, here's what I need for me. Let me give you a story to illustrate why it's so important. A gentleman had children and his wife, reasonably young, early 40s, his wife was, was dying, and he did everything he could to help her, thinking he was doing the best thing. A lot of care that just was difficult for everyone. After she died, he told the kids, you know, I just didn't know. I really didn't know. And I think I caused her more pain, and that just hurts me. I would never do that now. I would never want that done for myself. Please don't ever let that happen. Very nice man. Nice kids. That was years ago. He has since remarried. A very nice lady. He is now ill. He never told the new wife that. He became very ill, and the new wife is insisting on having more treatments. And the kids are saying, that isn't what Dad wanted. And the wife is saying, you mean you're telling me not to take care of my husband? Can you see the problem? Right now, he can't speak for himself, so who speaks for him? And unfortunately, he had never written down his preferences. So in a simple nutshell, that's what it is. It's writing down whatever you want to happen in that unfortunate situation where you can't communicate. Interestingly, in Arizona, we have a wonderful resource. It's the Secretary of State's website online, azsos.gov, or just Google it. At the Secretary of State's website, you can download for free all of the forms you would need for an advanced directive. This is just a brief introduction to hospice. There's a lot of information available, but people are sometimes scared by the idea of hospice. And that's what I want to clarify for you. Hospice is not a place to go to die. Hospice is a place to live as fully as you can for as long as you can. You get into hospice with a diagnosis that's terminal, a terminal diagnosis presumably within six months. But you know, there's no limitation to how long you stay. When I worked with hospice, sometimes we had patients who were treated so well that their life was extended beyond what was expected. Hospice is about palliative care. What palliative care means is that the medical establishment, your docs, are no longer trying to cure you. You have a disorder, you have a disease that's terminal. But instead of going through difficult, painful treatments, Palliative care says we're going to take care of the pain as much as we can take care of pain so that you have as much quality of life as is possible at this stage in your life. It is often such a relief for people to say, it is inevitable. All of the science tells me that. Can I please now relax and get rid of the pain, say my goodbyes, do what I need to do? There's a variety of hospices. They all work under this model. What most people don't know is right here in Phoenix, Arizona, there's over 30. Some are profit, some are nonprofit, some are religiously based, others are not. So you can do some homework and look at which hospice is best for you. Almost all of the hospices have inpatient facilities and at home care. Oh my gosh, that can be such a lifesaver for the caretaker, for respite care, and the hospice worker. You can keep the patient right there in their home where they'd like to be. The other pragmatic thing that's really important for you to know is Medicare pays for hospice and for all of the medications, at least the medication related to the disease that's, that's causing the terminal diagnosis. But Medicare will pay for it, so it's not a money issue. It's an issue of finding out what hospice and if it's right for you but please find out more about it before you make a decision. And good luck. Dealing with a loved one with depression can be so very difficult. 
So first, I want to acknowledge to you that it is as difficult for a caring, loving person who's dealing with someone who's depressed as the depressed person. No one else really remembers to say that to you. Let me tell you why. You need to know a little bit about depression. De the main thing of depression is the thinking. Depressed people think very much like each other as opposed to like the person they were. Depression is thinking past. It is past failure and it is total negative judgment. It's called the famous cognitive triad. Negative views of myself, I'm lower than a snake's belly, I'm dumb, short, ugly, whatever. Negative about the world, that's easy to do, isn't it? Nothing's going to happen good, the world is terrible. And the third, and this is the nail in the coffin, is negative about the future, hopeless. When someone is truly depressed, what they feel like is they're in a black hole and they can't get out, and here's the critical thing, and nothing is going to change. That's the part that sticks and hurts. If I absolutely believe that nothing is going to change, when you say to me, let's go shoe shopping, which ordinarily would be a great thing, why bother? If you say, let's go to a doctor, in my heart and head, I'm going to say, why bother? And if you are truly clinically depressed, you can't get out of that. It's like a fog. This cognitive fog comes over and puts you into hopelessness. When I do some workshops or work with some clients on this, I sometimes give them a trivial question. In 1850, Dante wrote The Divine Inferno. And he had a famous sign over the gates of hell. Do you remember what they were? Do, 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 do. All right. I'll tell you what they were. Abandon hope, all ye who enter. Even in 1350, a wise man knew that hell, quote unquote, is not having hope. And that's why it's so difficult to deal with someone else with depression. It will seem as though they are not even trying. They're making it worse. Yes, they are, but not intentionally. It's because why bother? So... Number one, don't try and cheer someone up if they're clinically depressed. If they're just feeling bad, try and cheer them up. But someone who's clinically depressed, don't try to cheer them up. It doesn't work. And what it really does is invalidate their emotions, which makes them feel worse about themselves. The message is how dumb, terrible, stupid, ingrateful, ungrateful, all of those things are you for being depressed. Don't do that. So what can you do? Connect with them. Connect with them. Remember last time you may have had something problem when someone was there and said, I can't solve it for you, but I'm there. Dang, I hate this for you. Little kids are good at that. When you ask them, if you're a little kid, about a problem, the little kids don't try and solve it for each other. They say things like, what are you going to do about those grown-ups? That sucks. And the other little kid goes, yeah, it does. And the feeling of validation is where you start. Now, if you're dealing with someone who's severely clinically depressed, they do need to get some help, and that's where you can get them some help. But they won't help you help them. But if you understand the dynamics, your expectations will be more in line. And some support for you, because depression is curable with therapy. Meds are not necessary for most people. For some, yes, but not for most. But good therapy, good cognitive therapy is. But you need some support too, or at least some reminders that what you're doing is not failing. It can't succeed with someone who's depressed at the moment.